and uh, I, this is my first semester here at ASU, and uh, I came in as a, a joint hire with the School for the Future of Innovation and Society, and then also in computing informatics and decision system engineering. Um, one of the first people I met when I was here um, for my sort of visit to campus was Eric, and we met in this room, and I was really impressed, um, and it definitely uh, made an impact on my my being, uh, you know, really excited to come here. So, and I, I think that you'll. One of my sort of dreams is to start utilizing this space in ways that maybe it hasn't been used yet. Um, and I think that a few of the questions that I was just asking Eric, um, you'll see why I'm interested in these particular questions, because uh, the, the, the groups that I have been working with over really the last um, uh, six or seven years now, I guess, um, they are deeply invested in what data can do for them, but also in spaces in which there is, in many ways, an absence or a total vacuum of so they, and, and then also in a space that is highly contested politically, uh, because you're talking about an energy justice movement in many ways. And so these are spaces that have been um, um, either self-identified or deemed out, you know, by others as, as sacrifice zones, um, as energy justice spaces where you have marginalized communities that um, have um, uh, fewer opportunities to voice their opinions um, in political uh, and technical processes in which uh, large-scale um, infrastructure projects, pipelines, um, oil and gas um, processing facilities and whatnot are being built in their communities. And so um, there is already an inherent um, asymmetrical power relationship that is very, very severe and significant in those spaces. And so trying to find parity um, is very difficult. And so uh, more often than not, you have contestation. And you have not necessarily compromise, but you have uh, a space in which people are using data to be able to directly attack or create an affront against another party. Uh, and so today I'm going to be talking about um, uh, work that, just to give you a little bit of background, uh, prior to coming here to ASU, I spent the last four years working in the nonprofit um, uh, research community for an organization called Cracked Tracker Alliance, which is a technical service provider organization that spun out of the University of Pittsburgh School of Public Health that was really about data transparency, science communication. Um, getting access to oil and gas data that was very difficult to have and then sort of putting it out there for people to be able to utilize. Um, and, and then prior to that, I was doing my dissertation research on citizen science water monitoring groups that were emerging across Marcellus Shale um, in, in response to perceived threats uh, to service water quality. And I was, in that case, very interested in what data was and what not doing for those people. How there were sort of claims of empowerment that get wrapped around citizen science projects, but then how that falls flat because they don't mobilize the data it sort of sits in archives or in scientific research and, and what are the kinds of mobilizations that are necessary for people to be able to move the needle in the way that they anticipated when they got into those projects. So what I'm going to be talking about today is work that I was involved in in that nonprofit research space for the last two years. It was specifically around how people were engaging with data related to oil and gas pipelines. And you'll see the connection to biodiversity data as we move forward in this. Obvious connections. You're talking about wetlands, you're talking about habitats. <coughs> um, and it's somewhat a uh, 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 sort of self-reflective uh, experience because <coughs> as a researcher in the space, I was doing the work and not studying the work. You know, this was a, not even a participant observation or participant in actually research project. It was sort of straight up activism in many ways. But I always had my research hat on and saying, what is it that we're doing here? You know, what is it that I'm participating in? How are people articulating their needs and what they're doing with this data as we move forward? And, you know, Publications that sort of came out of that, you know, that space and that mindset that you're working to read. <clears throat> and I'm going to talk a little bit about towards the end as to what it is that I'm now sort of pulling back and trying to think about what it is I want to do with this community moving forward. So um, I think that this sort of frames some of these basic research questions is what, you know, from what circumstances do you have these sort of informatics enabled activist movements? Um, and how do they fill critical knowledge gaps? And in what ways are they trying to use data to rearrange power? And I'm going to talk about this in two case studies um, that I've been involved with. One is related to a pipeline called Mariner East 2 pipeline, and the second called the Falcon pipeline, and both of these being built in the Pennsylvania uh, as well as Ohio uh, in West Virginia uh, geography. So uh, just to sort of couch this a little bit, uh, one of the ways that I've been trying to think about what happens in these spaces is um, a term that I've been searching around called civic informatics. And, is different from community informatics in which you might have people that use data and sort of community access issues and whatnot. It's perhaps different than the policy informatics in which you're looking at bigger projects and, and how people sort of integrate into political pro 
processes and, and it's really about how do people get access to data, push back against opacity, um, bring attention to intermediary groups that want to be part of that conversation, draw diverse people into that process, and really, um, in a very unabashed way, use data in service, uh, I'm sorry, that's supposed to say in service of advocacy, not advance. Um, now, this first case that I want to talk about with Sonoco uh, Sonoco Mariners 2, just a little bit of background. This is a two and a half billion dollar, 350 mile long pipeline that cuts across Tennessee. It's uh, set to carry 700,000 uh, plus barrels of ethane per day. Ethane is a byproduct of natural gas. Um, and uh, it's predominantly used to make plastics. Um, and it's the uh, largest pipeline project potentially in history. It's about 99% built at this point. Um, the reason why this is a very controversial pipeline in Pennsylvania is two reasons. One, it follows the right of way of a pipeline that was built in the 1930s. And there's been a lot of development that has occurred within that right of way over time. And so building this new pipeline means that they've had to do eminent domain. It means that they've had to build very close to a lot of built structures and populated areas. Um, and on top of that, there's a lot of other political things about like this isn't the, you know, the logic of energy independence that's taking ethane to export terminals, sell to Philadelphia, to sell to Chinese markets and sell to markets in Europe. And so it's really for private gain. And I'm happy to talk about some of the loopholes in which they're able to use a private project to be able to argue for eminent domain because usually you have to be a public utility, but that's a whole different thing. So the fundamental thing around pipeline projects is there are significant public knowledge gaps, significant asymmetrical awareness of what goes into being able to create this project, these kinds of projects. The reason for this is because Pipeline companies, they'll start three, four years in advance. Um, identifying likely routes, approaching landowners, getting easements signed, um, doing all the habitat assessments that need to be done to be able to justify that route. The public has absolutely no knowledge or participation in any of those processes. They only approach the people that are necessary. The landowner, um, a particular individual or a regulatory agency that has the data set that is the biological data set or you know, whatever is necessary to be able to do that assessment. And they do this all in house. And then all the way up to the point where they then submit their permit applications, the public has 30 days in which to review 75 to 100,000 pages of documents and, 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 and then produce any kind of a meaningful commentary that might actually allow them to shift the project or, or you know, be critical of parts that might have missed you know, things that are, that are important to them. Now, the Mariner East Pipeline is a really interesting example because at that time, I was also on the um, Environmental Justice Advisory Board for the state of Pennsylvania, and uh, there was a lot of sort of hammering of the DEP saying, this is the largest pipeline project in, you know, in Pennsylvania history. We have no shape files, we have no GIS data, we have nothing. All we have are these paper maps to go on. We have no way of being able to get the comprehensive sense of this project as a public. Um, there were NGOs that were making this argument, there were concerned citizen groups that were making this argument. I was making the argument from within the Environmental Justice advisory board that this is a justice issue, data is a justice issue. And, um, and they kept saying, well, you know, it's not really part of our protocol. And then odd thing happened, and I say reluctant to act with transparency because uh, an assistant director of another agency was in a conversation with a director of an, of an, of an advocacy organization saying, you know, why don't we have access to this data? It's a justice issue. And she said, oh, you know what, you're right. I'll just sort of email it to you. We have, we have this stuff. And then I, I, then I had another conversation with a person who was in charge of similar things at the DEP, and they're like, you know, how's it going? I'm like, oh good, you know, we really don't need that data anymore because we got it from another agency. And then like two days later, the DEP publishes the whole thing on their website saying, here's all this data, you know, mm -hmm. uh, this is the one shot deal, don't expect it next time, but we just happen to have access to it. It was sort of a saving face thing, like they knew that we had gotten it from elsewhere and they didn't want to sort of come off as the bad guys. Um, but the interesting thing is that, first of all, we got access to that data only seven days before the public comment period closed. Um, and we started to find some really interesting stuff. And unfortunately, the project was approved. And most of what I'm gonna talk about next happened after the pipeline was under construction. Um, and some of the really interesting things that we did as a coalition, one of which is we were able to calculate a blast zone for the pipeline, which you very rarely can do because you don't have route data. In doing this, we discovered that there were 40 schools that were within the one of which was only 500 feet away from the right of way. And what's a blast zone? A blast zone is an area of, um, well, it's really weird. The direct impact zone is where you have a 99% um, chance of not being killed in the, in, in the case of, of an explosion. And then the sort of impact or, or larger blast zone is one in which if there were an accident, that's the immediate evacuation zone that's mandated by um, NTSB and FERC. So 
Um, these people took this data, brought it to the press, got significant coverage in the Philadelphia media market, uh, as well as the Pittsburgh media market, did placards um, and lawn signs, and started going around uh, door to door and getting people who were in the blast zone to put these in their front yards. Um, when the election came, they actually shifted three municipal elections to a majority vote of uh, officials who were opposed to the pipeline, and then started passing local zoning laws to try and um, strengthen things like watershed protections that were above and beyond what the state would have otherwise had. And so they were able to take the data and mobilize in really significant ways, right? Um, another way that we were able to do this is we were able to now find out exactly what watersheds they had to cross using what crossing. And then when they started to pick up on violations because of drilling mud spills and sedimentation issues and whatnot, we were able to show the specific locations of those areas so that citizens who were concerned about this were able to then go and document that and bring that information to the state. And the project was halted twice, and over the course of this thing was fined um, almost $15 million because of these spills over the span of two years. These are still stalled because of these individual events. Um, and, um, and now they're kind of constructing pieces of the project to see if they can get a, a running pipeline by the end of the year because the investors are sort of starting to pull out because they're not sure if they're actually going to be able to finish the project. One of the things that I sort of came away with in this, and I should say that my analysis was doing a lot of that mapping work and then sort of interacting with the organization to say, like, what do you want to do with this? What can you do with this? Type thing? Um, and it was, a, it was always a then coming to me with questions and being like, well, let's see what we can do with it. You know, let's see if we can actually do that map. And in some cases, we couldn't do it. Um, but first of all, there were a couple of takeaways for this. Um, one is, I walked away saying, like, geez, what could, what, imagine what a, a, an energy justice movement could do if it actually had advanced access to, or at least advanced abilities to participate in this process all the way at the beginning of a planning stage of the pipeline. Would they be able to get to the point where they are satisfied with the outcome of the project, where they feel as though the eminent risks have been mitigated to some extent that they feel better about the project being built? Or is it always going to be like a no, the project should never exist sort of thing, right? So those are open questions that I have. In doing so, I started to realize that there was another thing that was happening here, and that most of these pipelines, they have to go through an environmental impact assessment process at the state level, at the federal level, and it tends to be this document that says, these are all the various options that we've assessed, and this is the one we're going with. What was happening in the outside space is groups that were mobilizing with things like the Mariner Statement. Um, they were sort of enabling and enacting these sort of critical environmental impact assessments, different imaginaries of how they perceive the risk and sort of going toe-to-toe -to -toe with the official documents or the sanctioned documents. That were doing things like exposing externalities, reduction, you know, rejection and reductionist assessments, and, and drawing out things like equity and democracy and values and all these things that impact assessments generally don't address, right? So, case study two. Um, Shell is building this massive ethane, ethane cracker, this big petrochemical project just north of Pittsburgh. It's going to be the largest ethane cracker in, in the country. Um, it's going to be designed to take ethane, turn it into ethylene, and then produce plastics on site. It'll be the largest emitter of VOCs in the state when it's done. Um, and advocacy groups have been fighting and fighting and fighting to stop this project, and they were unsuccessful. The state issued permits for it. And they were walking away very disillusioned. In the very last meeting of the DEP, in which it was like, you know, Here's a moment where we all kind of realize that the DEP is going to issue permits for this. Um, people are saying, you know, I wonder if there's something else that we could do to engage with this project. I know that they're going to need a pipeline of some kind to be able to get this ethane up here. And, and I was like, well, you know, Frack Truck is doing all sorts of stuff with pipelines. Let me see what I can do. Um, and so the next morning, I go back to my desk and I type in Falcon Pipeline GIS shapefile. And this is the part that always sort of raises people's eyebrows is that the engineering firm that was contracted to do the full EIA for this left other GIS so it was wide open to the public for letting the password protection. <laughs> Oops. Yeah, and so we sat there <laughs> for a couple of days and we're like, what do we do with this, you know? And then we called up our buddies over at the, you know, uh, the Cyberlock Clinic at Harvard and the uh, Data Law Clinic at UPenn and had extensive conversations with them and they drafted like a 30 page legal brief on what our liabilities were. And at the end of the day, they said, you have a really interesting lawsuit, which they said, you never want to hear, but you'd probably win them at the end of the day. <laughs> and, all, and they said, you probably don't want to hear that either. And so we took all those calculations into account and we went to our board and other people and we decided to go for it. And so um, over the span of about eight months, um, we built a coalition of groups that were invested in this Ethan Cracker project to begin with and started to go through the data, which was changing every single day. It was like having a window into the ways in which they were constructing this project and trying to figure out what questions would we ask of this data. 
Um, and, and we started to prioritize things that were coming out of that coalition. They wanted to know what the route was and the right of way and what properties were you know, being leased and what were the wetland and stream crossings and the proximity to populated areas, what were the impact zones, sensitive habitat, species of concern. And some of these were legitimate issues that they were concerned about on their property or in their community. In other cases, it was these are the strategic hooks that we're going to be able to use to shut down this project. You know, and so there was a sort of range of reasons why people were wanting to engage with this data. Um, and so we went through the process of this, you know, and this wasn't like download the Excel spreadsheet because this wasn't accessible data. It was doing things like OCR capturing screenshots and then converting that into Excel tables and spending hours and hours and hours of doing this through thousands of data points or loading up new GIS layers and hand tracing mm. the boundaries of watersheds and hand tracing the pipeline route. Like, you know, thousands of hours of labor time on the part of myself and other people to be able to reconstruct this. And there were lots of questions. We were looking at metadata that were in the tables that we could see that the shell engineers had been constructing. We didn't know what terminology meant. We didn't know what their sort of uh, abbreviations meant. And so we just kept archiving and archiving and archiving this stuff. And we had these very strategic conversations about like, when do we go public with this? What do we do with it? Do we want to wait until the permits are submitted so that we can continue to sort of see this evolve and see the most recent state of it? Or do we go immediately public with it and try and get people involved in the process now and then lose access to the data immediately because then they would know that we have access to it. And these were some of the questions we were struggling with in the background. In the end, we decided to wait so that we could have the robust idea of the project at the very last moment and construct our critical environmental impact assessment so that when the permit applications were submitted, we could put ours right next to it and go to the agencies and say, these are all the things that were not accounted for in this, right? And so that was the long-term strategy on this. Meanwhile, in the back end, we were trying to figure out ways to build capacity around this data. One of the things that we did for, um, for groups, uh, the Clean Air Council and local chapters of the Sierra Club in particular, was we built walk sheets of all the properties that they were approaching landowners for uh, signing easements. And uh, going and doing canvassing notes, inviting people to landowner education workshops to be able to notify them of what their rights were. This wasn't an eminent domain case. How do they get in touch with lawyers to be able to have stronger contracts that don't necessarily allow the company to do anything that they want on the property, have specific language. Um, and um, we held three workshops uh, over the span of three months in three different counties. We also found really specific instances of concern. For instance, in this case here, the pipeline was gonna cut through the headwaters as well as the raw water line of a drinking water re uh, uh, reservoir that supplied nine municipalities. We brought this information to the manager of the Ambridge Water Authority, who then issued a very public letter saying that they oppose the project and its current route. Um, and, and so building that very powerful alliance, I think in many ways sort of turned the tide and bring more attention to this. Um, we found out that the pipeline, um, there were easements that had been signed with a developer on three large farms uh, to agree to have the pipeline go through this area and started subdividing it out for like a 300 house um, subdevelopment. And none of the people who had purchased those homes knew that there was an easement running right down the street in front of the house for this pipeline. Um, so that really mobilized that particular community and the press, of course, we were constantly building allies with the press as we were doing these work. Um, and getting to, I just brought this up because of uh, the sort of biodiversity and species data. One of the things that we very rarely have access to is what were the various sort of habitat assessments that they have to do. They're only going to su supply data to the state to be able to satisfy permits that they need. And because this is not something that went to a federal level for approval, reasons for that I, I'm happy to explain, they only need to get state by state approval. And in Pennsylvania, in order to build this pipeline, they only need to get permits for sedimentation control and watershed crossing. They don't have to get any approval for whether or not there are species of concern in the area, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. They just have to show that they've done some kind of due diligence to, to work around them. And so we never have access to things like, where are all the fresh, fresh water mussel locations? Where are the places in which are the bat roosting trees that are in proximity to the workspaces? And so we have all this information as well. Um, and we're able to do things like map out the, uh, the high consequence areas and species of concern that were within those high consequence areas. Ultimately, they did submit the permit application and we published all of this as a series of interactive maps and all of the analysis um, that were you know, uh, co-authored by groups that we were working with. And it, it made some pretty significant differences. First of all, that 30 day uh, comment period that would have been allotted to that, they extended to four months because they had so many people that were starting to write and call into the agencies who wanted to comment on this. They also held three public hearings in different parts of the state where that would not have been obligated to do that previously. Um, they also issued a, a number of really significant technical deficiencies to the Shell Pipeline application 
um, based on findings that we had discovered in our EIA that had not been articulated in their EIA. Um, and as it stands, um, they are still in the process of negotiating those permit applications with Shell in a really protracted way that, that, that has so far gone on much further than I think anybody had expected. And we're still sort of waiting to find out what what's going to happen with this project. And it's very likely going to get approved in some way. And I imagine that it's going to go to litigated phases in which it will probably turn out very similar to what happened with Mariner Reefs, where you're going to see losses spiral, right? One of the things that I'm really interested in this particular project is, um, you know, this is just sort of a summary piece, um, but you know, we're actually going to see this sort of overlap with civic informatics and critical aid and EIAs. And, um, but one of the things that I'm really interested in is, at the end of the day, let's sort of push this out a year from now, two years from now. If and when the Falcon pipeline gets built or gets rejected, did our access to this data two years in advance really move the needle at all? Are you going to end up in the same place where Mariner East was, where we had access to the data after the thing was already come under construction? You know, does just access make the difference? It's a really interesting question that I'm, I'm looking to find out. Or does it require something else? Does it require also opening up deliberative spaces similar to this, in which you have to find a way to get these people who are, who hate one another, like really literally hate one another for various reasons, into a room to try and talk about this data that they otherwise, on top of which, will never have access to because of all the strategic reasons of why the industry does not want people to have access to this data because it makes their life miserable when they do. Um, so these are like really fundamental problems to being able to have deliberative spaces around these kinds of projects. I'd love to talk to you about this one. Um, and the other really interesting thing about this, going back to my dissertation research and studying citizen science water monitoring networks, right? One of the things that kind of came out of that research was uh, a broad survey of why people were getting involved in these projects and why organizations were launching these monitoring projects. And, what the infrastructure looked like that enabled this. And one of the interesting things is that most of the people were coming to that work because they wanted to participate in basic science or they wanted to be there for an educational opportunity or to educate the public on potential risks. And a real sliver of those organizations and people were there for activist reasons, right? At the end of the day, over the span of watching this movement for five or six years, I saw at best maybe two or three instances in which their science and their data actually made some kind of a difference in the way in which they imagined, whether it be shutting down a well pad or you know, finding an operator because of a violation of a spill. Um, whereas with the pipeline groups, we're seeing all over the country, people using the processes very similar to what I just described with Mariner East and with the Falcon Pipeline to make, in the mind of an activist anyway, substantial differences in the ways in which these projects are being halted, being done differently, um, taking, you know, the, Mar the, 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 um, the Mountain Valley Pipeline that cuts down the East Coast um, has been, um, you know, suspended indefinitely because of two water crossings that people argued when the permits were not approved and effective work. There's been an entire pipeline across New York State that was denied entirely by the DEQ because they, they just chose not to issue the water crossing permits because of all of the various ways in which activist groups sort of poked holes in the, in, in the project. And, um, the Sable Trail that was in Florida was rejected outright because the CR Club argued that the EIA did not account for the cumulative climate impacts of methane emissions and all these various ways in which the EIA has been the space in which they've been able to move the needle. What is this about? Why is it that they, is it because they come to it from an activist mindset? Is it because they're mobilizing the data in really political ways as opposed to apolitical ways? Is it because they found different levers to pull? Um, in, in, in these processes and what the citizen science water monitoring groups have done, but yet they're all kind of functioning in the same space. So they're, they're kind of like within the same logic and the same context of what the contested area is, why are there such significant differences in this? And that's a, and it's a question that I'm starting to explore moving forward. Um, this is just kind of a map of a few other pipelines that are in, in sort of you know, similar uh, areas of contestation at present. There's many more besides this very kind of convenient map that I found the other day. Um, and, and this is just sort of a map out of the, the sort of stakeholders that I'm seeing at uh, different levels and trying to figure out how does data flow throughout those relationships and where are the places at which you really see organizations making these intervention points. That kind of wraps it up for me. Um, and, you know, a question, and I'll just sort of, you know, I get this question every time I do a presentation like this, which is, how do you feel about being an activist scholar, right? And I'll just answer it um, outright because I'm sick of having to answer it, um, which is, I don't see myself as an activist scholar. You need to think about what the domain of knowledge is that you're questioning. You know, if I was studying, you know, if I was a person who studied lung cancer as a result of smoking, 
I don't first need to say, well, you know, smoking may or may not cause cancer, but yet I'm going to study it as a domain of knowledge. People don't question somebody who's studying lung cancer and they're, they're biased towards the principles of whether or not they think that smoking was the cause. In my defense, I do believe that the energy industry does have uh, an abnormal amount of power in these spaces and they take advantage of it. They do roll over communities and they do look for opportunities to be able to shut down public participation. And I do think that the energy industry is very damaging to those communities. I will just take that as, as a fact in my research. And having spent 10 years studying this space, I'm very, very comfortable in saying that. My domain of knowledge, however, is not that. My domain of knowledge is how do people use data to do what it is they want to do in these various spaces. And in that, I do feel very objective. And if you read some of my work, I'm also very critical of the ways in which people try and do that. And so, um, yeah, that's my argument.